Uh, welcome to Java Programming 1. Uh, in this lectures, we are going to learn about how to use the built-in classes and objects given by Java API. That's Java Application Program Interface, which consists of Java and Java Library files. Uh, so this is our lecture unit three, part one. So again, our objective is to learn how to create an object and also discuss what is an object reference, how to use the Java API class library files. Uh, this normally consists of Java packages, uh, which normally consists of classes. Example is we're going to use only two types of classes in this lecture. Again, Java has so many built-in classes. But in this class, we're going to use the random and also the math class. Random class make it possible for us to generate a random values based on the type of method we call and also the argument of the method, uh, the type of values we need. Math class have so many functions in mathematics. For example, in trigonometry, how to find a sine, cosine, tangent, uh, square root, find the power of a value, absolute value, uh, so many. So math classes normally consist of mathematical functions. And a random class normally make it possible for us to be able to generate any random values as an input to our program, or even to print the random values. So those are our main objective. So the first thing is creating objects. And we set the variable other holds primitive value or reference to an object. If we discuss it by the Java primitive data types, such as uh, integer, double, float, these are double and float are decimal values. Integer will be whole numbers or character, a boolean. Uh, normally a primitive data type, when we declare variable as int, we don't have a built-in method to manipulate that very value, to manipulate the value. We, if I want to do any operation, I have to write a method myself. But the reference or objects, uh, such as string or any object type that is not primitive type, is kind of a class. It's a class. So example is a string, it's a class. And we know a class consists of methods and also the variables that it will work on. The variable will normally store the data that the methods need. So when I declare variable as a string, which is an object, I can use the method to copy the string or to know the length of the string, how many characters I have, etc. So that's the major difference between primitive type and the object type or reference. And we may discuss this a little bit detail. So first we say a class name can be used as a type to declare an object reference variable. So as we said, a string is a data type, but it's a class. Now, when I create title, title is not a primitive data type. The reason why it's not a primitive variable is that the data type of a title is a class. So it's an object. Now, when I declare a title as an int, then it's a primitive type. So no object is created so far. This is just a declaration. Uh, we have the class name and the name of the object. We haven't, again, create the variable or the memory location, I would say, the object. So normally in order to create the object, we need to call what we call a constructor. A constructor is a special method that have the same name as the class and it normally initialize the object when we are creating an object. So here we say an object reference variable holds the address of an object. So when I declare an object type 
string and the object name is title. When I assign a string to title, actually the content will not be in the title. Rider title will be pointing to where the content is located. And that's what we mean that we mean by object reference variable holds the address of an object. It holds the address of an object that containing the title. And we may discuss this a little bit more. So an object itself must be created separately. So now we have created our object. So we first of all declare our object, the type is a string and the name of the object is title. Now when I use the keyword new and also the constructor string with this argument Java software solution, I'm now creating the object title and I'm assigning the content Java software solution to it. So here we say this, this is called a string constructor, which is a special method that set up the object. So as I may use the term to initialize the object. So generally we use the new operator to create an object, as we said earlier, and also creating an object have a special term, which we call instantiation. Instantiation. This is the process of creating an object. So an object is an instance of a particular class. An object is an instance of a particular class. So how do we invoke a method? This is object-oriented program. In order to invoke, invoke a method, I will need the object name, then I have used the dot operator, then the method. So let's say I want to invoke a method name length so that it will give me the number of characters I have in the title object. So I'm going to write title dot length. And since length is a method, we have to open and close a parenthesis. That's the argument of the length. So this is a, a way of invoking a method. You always start with the object name, then the dot operator, then the method. And we have an example here. So we already have a title. It's our object, the type is a string, and it has some string content in it. So when I say string dot length, length is a method, so we have the open and close parenthesis, that will be our empty argument. It will give me the number of characters I have in the title string. So we are returning, we are assigning the length to a variable name norm Charles. And most likely the norm Charles here I'm going to declare it as an int. The data type will be int because the length will give me the number of characters. So if it's 10 characters, it will give me 10. Uh, you have to give me a whole number. So a, me a method may return a value which can be used in an assignment or an expression. In this case, we use it in an assignment. We assign the returning value, which is the number of characters we have in the title object to norm Charles. We can also use, I can use this expression in a formula or expression if I want to use it for something. So a method invocation can be thought of asking an object to perform a, a service. Now what is a reference? Uh, this diagram will explain to us when we, we declare a variable int num1 and assign 38 to it, the 38 will be stored in a memory location. When I declare variable as a string and the name is name1, the content of it will be stored where my variable is pointing to, the location where it's pointing to. So we can see here Steve Jobs is not in name1 variable, it's rather the address of that location it is. So here we say note that a primitive variable always contains the value of itself, like num138. But an object variable contains the address of the object. So it contains the address of the object. The object is Steve, Steve Jobs, Jobs. So an object reference can be thought of as a pointer 
to the location of the object. So it points to the location of the object. Rather than dealing with arbitrary addresses, we often show a reference graphically. Now let's revisit assignment. So we have num1, num2. And first, we assign num1 to num2. What will happen is that we are saying that num1 is what, 38, but we are assigning it to num2. So num2 becomes also 38. So this is the result. This is a primitive data type. The variable contain the actual value. Now let's see for the reference. In the reference assignment, see what happened. We have name one and name two. Name one have a Steve Jobs, name two have Steve Wozniak. Now, when I assign name one to name two, that means I'm assigning Steve Jobs to Steve Wozniak. Well, the content doesn't change. What will happen is that the pointer name two will now point to what? Name one location also. And that's the solution here. So we can see what the assignment operator, what it's doing is that it's changing the direction of the pointer to name one because we assign name one to name two. And this is a reference variable. So for object references, assignment copies the address, does it? It copies the address, not the content. With the primitive, primitive type, it copies the content. So the content of the variable will change. But with assignment operator, with uh, object references, it copies the address. So that comes to us what is the aliases in Java. Aliases is what we just created now. Anytime we have one of, let's say, two or more variable pointing to one location, then it's called aliases. So two or more references that refer to the same location or the same object are called aliases of each other. So name one alias can be name two or name two alias is name one because both of them have the same content now because they are pointing to the same object location. So that creates an interesting situation. One object can be accessed using multiple reference variables. In this case, I can use name one and name two. Aliases can be useful, but we should manage it very, very careful. And changing an object through one reference is what will happen? It will change all the aliases. So this is the reason why we have to manage it carefully. I have name one and name two appointed to the same location. When I change, use name one to change the, uh, the content, name two automatically changes also. So we have to be very careful. We talk about garbage collection in Java. Uh, this means if we have an object and the object was dereferenced, it's not referenced to anything, uh, Java automatically will delete it out. So in Java, garbage collection is done automatically. Unlike a language like C++, actually that's why C++, we have a constructor that again will set up the object or initialize the object. Also, we have the constructor that will delete the object when we don't need it. But in Java, we don't have no the constructor because of automatic, garbage collection system. So here we say when an object no longer has any valid references to it, it can no longer be accessed by the program. So the object is useless and this is called garbage. But Java performs automatic garbage collection periodically, returning an object memory to the system for future use. So again, we don't do this, Java done it automatically. In other languages, programmer is responsible for performing garbage collection, such as C++. So next we move to our string class. As we said, we're going to discuss about this class, string class, then math class, then random class. 
So we start with the uh, string class. Because strings are so common, we don't have to use the new operator to create a string object. So the example would be, instead of using the new string and having Java software solution and argument, I can leave it like this, it's very simple. This is only with only one single class, which is string. Apart from string class, any class that we are trying to initialize our object, we have to call the constructor. So it will say somewhere, this is a such special sentence that works only for string. Now, each string literal and close in double quotes represent a string object. So Java software solution is one string object. Strings have a lot of method. So once we create a string object, we can use the string methods that come with the string class to again, and manipulate with our string object. For example, concatenate, I can join another string to my existing string. Uh, copy, I can copy a string from one location to another. Uh, so many, so many. Uh, we can check the string, compare if two strings are the same or different. So therefore, we say that an object of a string class is immutable. Immutable means when we create a string object, we cannot change the content if we have the content already. Neither its value nor its length can be changed. However, several methods of string class return a new string object that are modified version of the original. So when we create a string the first time, let's say the title, we say Java is a solution or whatever string we give to it. We cannot change it. The only way we can change the content is by using the existing string methods that is given to us in the string class. And we will see an example soon. So it is occasionally helpful to refer to a particular character within a string. Also, this can be done by specifying the character's numeric index. And also the indexes always begin at zero in each string. So it's same as a ray. When you have a string, the first character starts from zero. So let's say we have hello. Hello means the first index, which is the first character H is zero. Then E is one, L, then another L, then zero. Then O, sorry. So that's the example they gave us. In the string hello, the character H is at in the zero. And the character O, which is the last character, is in this four, which means we have five characters from zero to four. So let's see an example here, string mutation or Java. This is a program, and it will help us to, again, understand the concept of string class. So we have a, our main class name is string mutation, and that makes our name of the file as string mutation or Java. This program will demonstrate the use of the string class and its methods. So we have our main method, public, static, void, main, string, argue. We declare variable name, phrase, but it's an object, why? Because the type is a class. So we have a string class, declare an object, and we assign changes inevitable. So here, not only declaration alone, but we also have done what we have created the object because we have given the content of the object. Of object. We said earlier, we don't need to use the constructor and the new keyword for only string class. So next we create another string like four of them, mutation one, mutation two, mutation three, mutation four. We can have all the four object string object type in one line with a comma, space between because they are all the same data type string. So next we have system.tar.println and we say original string is whatever is in the phrase and the phrase is changed is inevitable. So we have original string, whatever content. Now next we have system.tar.println. We want to know the length of the string. So what we need to do we need to have the object first, then dot, 
then the method that can return the length of the string, which is we call the length. So here we can see we have a phrase dot length. This will give it the length of the string. Now next we have phrase again dot concate. Concate is a method in a string class that make it possible for us to join two strings together. So what is here is that we have a content of a string phrase, which is change is inevitable. Now we are joining it with a set from vending machines. So now mutation one have the string change is inevitable, which is from phrase and a set from vending machines, which is the new string that we are joining to a string that is in a phrase. Then the next, we have the sentence in mutation one. We call mutation one dot to uppercase. To uppercase is a special method in a string class that will convert all lower cases to uppercase. So here we're still going to have the same string we have in mutation one, but we change everything to uppercase. Next, we have a method called replace. Replace method will take two arguments. One will be the character that you want to replace. Then the next will be what is replacing it with. So this means anywhere I see E in my, my string, mutation two, anywhere I see E, I'm replacing it with X. That's it. Replace means two argument. What are you replacing with what? So the first item will be what you are replacing. The second will be what you are replacing it with. So I'm replacing, replacing E with X. Now the next is the substring method. Substring method also takes two arguments. But what substring method, actually that's why it's called sub and a string. What substring method does is that if I have a string, I can take some part of it. Let's say I have a string with five characters from in the zero to four. I can call a substring and give it in the zero to two, which means I'm taking two characters out. So that's why it's a substring of there. So here we have three and 30, which means I'm going to start from in three, number three position in the string, and I'm going to end at 30. Now we finish with everything. Next step is to print all our strings. So we print mutation one, mutation two, mutation three, mutation four. And we say mutated length is mutation four dot length. So we want to know the length of the last string. So let's see our output. First, we remember we said our output will be the same thing because in a system dot r dot print, we are doing what? We have the phrase to be print. And that's it, we didn't do anything. We just want to print phrase. Second, remember the length of the string is 20. We have the system.r.println. This time, we use the method name length. And that will give us how many characters we have. Next, we change it's a vitable set from the vending machines. That's concrete, concrete net. Now, when we concrete, uh, previous string is only changes uh, inevitable, but in the concrete argument, we have a set from vending machines. So you join the two for us. Then next we call to uppercase. So it's the same string, but we change everything to uppercase using what to uppercase method. Then next we said anywhere we see E, we want to replace it with X. So we can see E is here. The change we have E, now change N with X. We have inevitable, the third character is E, now it's X. So everywhere we see E, we accept the first character is E, now it's X. So anywhere we see E, we replace it with X. That's why we use the object name, title dot replace, the argument I'm replacing E, comma, with space, with X. And that's how, then the next one was the soft string. So you can see that we are not printing all the string here. We start from three. So this is zero, one, two, three, three is N. So we start, uh, then we end at 30. So this should give us number 30 position. Then last, 
our mutation for we want to know the length of it so we call the length method which is in, in right here mutation for dot length and that gives us 27. so this program is very interesting program to get the concept of object oriented concept here we are dealing with class class is an object class and we have a string from class we can create an object and our string class we create a, an object named phrase which is part of a string we should know every class have a method string have a couple of method example to uppercase to change all the characters in the string to uppercase replace a specific letter to another letter so replace we take two argument e and x Substring means I want to get sub part of the string. So I have to save from the beginning to the end what uh, dimension I want or where I want to start and end. And then later we just print everything. So this is a very quick check. What output is produced by the following program? Again, we can see this program. We have our string name str, we say space, the final from frontier. So if I have system.r.println str.let, remember str is the string object dot the method. This will return the, the size of the string. So we have to count one, two, three, four, comma is five, space is six. So every symbol or space is a one character. So 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. It's like 26. 26. Next, we say string, substring 7. Now, when we say 7, and we didn't show 2, previously we said 3 to 30, which means we start from the third index. Last is the 30. 30. But here we have 7, which is the starting. If we didn't specify the end, it means from seven to the end. So if I'm going to the end, you don't need to specify it unless I'm going to stop somewhere before the end. Let's say I have 12 characters, I want to stop at 10. Then I'm going to have seven and 10. I start from seven, I want to go to the end. Let's just write seven. Then the next method is to change to uppercase and the last method to give us the length. And we can see 26, we count it. Uh, here we have the final front. You can see that it start, we miss space. We are starting from seven. So space is S, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So space is five characters, comma, six, and space, seven. So we miss that word and we start from the final frontier. Since we have only seven, that's it we have to go to the end when we have a substring actually it's right here when we have a substring seven to three or so, sorry seven to ten then we start at seven and end at ten now when we have only seven that means to the end then we also change to uppercase and also the length so next we talk about few class library files as we said earlier java have a special package which is called a uh, java.lang but java language package automatically imported into our program so we don't need to import it and from that the reason why because java.lang package is always used in any program the system.out.println system class is inside the java.lang so because of that we don't need uh, automatically uh, imported for us now, if I want to use the scanner class, we did that already. I have to, I need a utility package. So java.util.asterix. So various classes we have already used, such as system. This is system.r.printer that belongs to java.lang. And also scanner belongs to java.util. And also the string are part of Java standard class library. And we have so many of class library file, which we also refer to as API. And that's what takes us to the next section, the Java API. So Java class library is sometimes referred to as Java API. 
API stands for Application Program Interface. So crosses of related classes are sometimes referred to as a specific API. Example can be string package. It's a special package for going graphical user interface. So we call it string API. Database such as JDBC packages connectivity. And we can call it database API. And there are so many APIs. It is an example of a Java document from Oracle was now Java is owned by Oracle. So if you go to oracle.com, search for Java, you see all the Java documents, library files, everything. So this is an example of few Java library files, like java.awt. AWT stands for abstract window tools. So if I'm creating a Java going, like using applet or using uh, Java packages for AWT or swing package, uh, we can create a going. So this is for creating going. So these are some of, these are some of the packages. So java.lang general underscore the general support is always in the system for us. If I'm creating an applet, then I need java.applet because applet have special drawing program that I can use the, I mean drawing method that I can use the method to draw the applet. And the method belongs to the applet class. We also have the abstract window tools, Java AWT dot AWT. This is for graphics and going. Same thing with the Java X dot swing. This is swing package, additional graphics also. Java dot net, that's the network communication. I can create two Java programs to communicate with each other if I can use the java.net package very well. Then we have the java.util, that's for utilities. A very good example we saw is getting an input from a keyboard. We have to use the utility package. So this often overlap with specific API, and these are all the examples. Now, anytime I'm using a package, I have to import it. So for example, java.util.scanner, I want to use the scanner class. If I like, I will have java.util.asterix, which means I'm importing every method in the utility package. Or this means I'm importing only the class scanner with this method in utility package. But in order to do this, we already done it before. We have to use the import keyword. So the best way is we say import java.util.scanner. This will import the scanner class to our game program. And scanner also is used for getting input. So to import all classes in a particular package, and that's what we always do, use the asterisks. So here I can say import java.util.asterisk. Asterisk is only one symbol. Instead of writing all this scanner of five, or five to seven or eight characters. So we always use asterisk, java.util. And the good thing about asterisk is that when you use it, it means you have imported all the classes. So you don't need to import it. If you are using more than one method in one class, you don't want to keep importing the class always when you need to use a method. Import the whole method for that class using the asterisk. And now you can, again, use any class belongs to the java.it package. So that's the import declaration. Uh, the syntax, we start with the import space, java.lang.asterisk. This means I'm going to use the java.lang package and I'm importing all the methods in that package. So that's why I'm using asterisk. So the scanner class on the other hand is part of Java UT package. So therefore must be imported. We also have the random class, as we said earlier, random class make it possible for us to generate random values. So here random class is part of Java UT package. It provides methods that generate pseudo or pseudo random numbers. And we will see examples soon. 
a random object performs complicated calculations based on a seed value to produce a stream of seemingly random values. So let's see this program called random numbers or Java. So we have our main class the name is random numbers. So the file name will be random numbers or Java. We import the random class. Here also I can use only the util package to import everything, but we decided to import only the random class. So we start with our main method, public statistic void main. Now we have a, a class name random. So we generate random object. And here the object name is generator using the new keyword. We also declare two variable int and num. Uh, I mean num one for int. And then the second one, num two is float or decimal value. So what we do first, we want to generate any whole number. So we use the object name generator. Generator is object type random class. So generator.nestInt without showing any instruction on the argument. This means I can generate any whole number, any value, a whole number. So next, we also have next in 10 plus one. This means I want to, previously we just have next in nothing. So I generate any number. Now we can generate only 10 numbers, but we start from one because 10 numbers means from zero to nine. 10 means zero to nine values. But when we have plus one, it means we're going to start from one to 10. And then we print it out. We generate another number, we say 15 numbers, but we start from 20. So that will be 20 to 35. Actually 20 to 34, which is 35 values. Then next we have 20 minus 10. The same int again, but this time we are going from zero to 90. But minus 10 means we come back 10. So instead of zero, we are starting from negative 10 to nine. So next we generate float. Uh, float we generate. So here random float between, so here we use the next float. Then we say random float generate between zero to one. There's no anything in the argument. So with int, if there's nothing, it means we can generate any whole number. But with decimal, it means we can generate any decimal numbers. And most decimal numbers are falling between 0 to 1. So that's why here we say random float from 0 to 1. Then next, we say next float and 6, which means 0, 0.0 to 5.99. Because times 1 is nothing to 3 of the 6. Then next, we say num2 plus 1. So we had one to num two, and we assign the value to num one, and we print the content of num one. So that's why we say from one to six, the content will be three. And this is another quick check for random class. So if I say next in 25, it means I'm going to generate the values from zero to 24. Now when I say net, int 6, it means my values will be from 7 to uh, 13. Then next int 100 plus 10, it means I will start from 110 to 120, 10 values. Then next int 10 minus 5 means I will start from 5 to 14. Then 22 and 12 means I'll have 22 to 12. Give me 36, and I don't want to have more than 22. So that's the value, 0 to 24, 1 to 6, 10 to 109, 100 to 149. Because we start from 100 because 50. 
So 50 from 0 to 50. So I mean, some 0 to 40 now will give me 50. But since I say plus 100, 0 plus 100 will be 100. So we had 100 to the end. Same thing here. We say next say 10 minus 5. We are decreasing by 5. So instead of from 0 to 9, then it will be again minus 5 to 4, which is still 10. So this is another range quick check. If I need a range from 0 to 12, then I'll have 13. If I need range from 1 to 20, now it's from 1. So if I put 20, that means it will start from 0 to 19. So I have 1 to it, so it will be 1 to 20. Now 15 to 20, I'll start from 6. Six numbers I want to generate plus 15. So I'll start from 15. And the last one we have 11 minus 10. It's next int again. So here I'm going to start from minus 10. And since it's 10 values, then it will end at zero. So we also have the math class. As we said earlier, math class belongs to java.lang, so we don't need to import any package when we're going to use it. It consists of so many functions. For example, give me yes, absolute value, find the square root, find the exponential, which is our e, find the trigonometric functions like sine, cosine, etc. So the math class, again, have a method, and the method does, does most of all the work. So let's see an example here. I want to find a cosine of a value. I'll use the cosine method. But again, I have to start with math.cosine. I want to look for square root of a value. So I'll say math.square root data. So I can use this class inside the formula if I know how to use it well. And it's very important that we learn how to use this math class. Also, we discuss the static method further in our future videos. We're going to discuss more. A static method is a method that doesn't rely on objects. So you see, when we have the string class, we have to create a string, ob a str string object before we can again do what info the string methods. So the syntax will be the object name dot, the method we invoke then do whatever you want to do. But that's different from math class. Math class is a static class. A static class is a class that doesn't depend on object or cl other classes. So here we can see that we have math.course. I want to use the method course, but I don't need to create an object of the math class. The only thing I have to use the class math.course. So math is a static, again, method, a static method. Hmm. So we have quadratic.java. We are going to use some math. So we have our, we import a scanner class. Our main method, uh, class name is quadratic. So the file name is quadratic.java. We have the main method. We declare three variable ABC. We also declare variable name discriminant root one root two. Now we have the user to enter an input. We are going to use the scan object to do it. And here we tell the user to enter the A. Then the user enter the B, then user enter the C. Now, if I'm looking for quadratic, the first thing I look for is the discriminant, which is the square root of what? B squared minus four AC. But you see here, we use the math.pow. That's the power for B squared. So the base is B, exponent is two. So that's when it will be the second value argument. So when we find the power b squared, then we multiply by 4ac. Now next, we have to find the square root of it. The formula says square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. We have find the 4ac. And uh, so now we find the square root of b squared minus 4ac. Then when we get a square root, that's when we're using math.square root discriminant, what we have here, 4 ac Then we divide by 2a, the formula is the square root of 4 ac and b squared minus 4 ac over 2a. 
So when we get the two, we finish. We get our answers. Then we print our two answers. So it depends on the value we enter. Here yeah, we enter three and eight and four for ABC. And that gives us again the discriminant value and also the root value. The root values are two, root one, root two. And we're going to end here. So again, in these lectures, we talk about how to use the built-in Java classes. We saw example of a string class. We also saw example of the math class and also the random class, how to use them. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to send an email. Thank you. Wish everybody.